So we have a sphere and the sphere has thin walls, metallic, and it has nitrogen inside. Nitrogen is at 77 Kelvin, so about minus 200 Celsius. The container has a diameter of 0.5 and is covered and is covered with an evacuated reflective insulation composition of silica powder. Silica is simply silicon oxide, right? SiO2. Uh, the insulation is 25 millimeters thick and its outer surface is exposed to ambient air at 300 Kelvin. Convection coefficient is known to be 20. So note that this guy showed up again, convective coefficient, right? That's the H we just talked about on the pro previous problem. That's a horrible highlighting what we just did. Um, the enthalpy of vaporization in the density of liquid nickel nitrogen is two to the fifth joules per Kelvin in 804. What is the rate of heat transfer to the liquid nitrogen and what is the mass loss rate per day of boil off? Liquid boil off. So let's start with this coefficient. Okay, remember that I told you it's not dependent on the distance anymore. So the resistance due to convection is not dependent on the distance. It's just one over h a. Why is that? Well, you remember the part that we talked about in the beginning with the water and how convection works. Remember that we had this little molecule in the bottom that I forgot the name we gave it. I think it was Alex. Remember that if Alex grabbed energy, it would become less dense and it would therefore go upwards. Well, Alex doesn't really care whether it's going to stop here, stop here, or stop here. Because what's driving it to move is not its difference in temperature per se. What's driving its movement, it's difference in density, right? So because it doesn't really care on whether the distance it's going to travel will be this x here, this x here, or this, uh, probably do, this x, this y, or this z here, right? That's why we lose that dependency on convection from that x that we have here before, right? That's why we don't have that dependency anymore. And that's why the convective coefficient now is given in watts per meter squared Kelvin or Celsius as opposed to meter, right? Check it out over here, okay? Because it doesn't really depend on the distance it's going to travel. Okay, that being said, what do we have here? What do we have? We have a um, 300, T infinity is 300. Inside we have nickel nitrogen at 77 Kelvin. So that means that we have Q going from the outside to the inside, okay? Now, there's two things that are different in this problem from what we did so far. The first thing is that this is a sphere, right? And being a sphere, the convective, uh, resistance, just like it changes the cylinder, it will change the sphere, right? And it will be one over four pi, and you can see this four is coming from the area, right? Four pi r squared, four pi k times, make sure I don't get this wrong, four pi k, one over r1 minus one over r2. Okay, that's the resist resistance due to conduction. So this is conduction, conduction on a sphere. The second thing that's new is that now we have to have a convective resistance. If you guys recall the problem we just did, we had um, steam, and we have a steel pipe, and we had the insulation, the other insulation, and then we had air, okay? If you think about it, right, uh, probably this is probably the best example to use. For my energy to leave the out, the air outside and actually reach the right the middle of the nitrogen, it has to go through the air, the insulator, and then through all this nitrogen here, like it can find its way there. So although it doesn't really depend on temperature, it does have the the fact that there's matter there in the way of energy traveling does create a resistance, right? So if you were to go back into this problem in which we had steam, steel, insulation, insulation, air, if we're taking into account every single resistance, we would have a system that would be T air over here, then a resistance due to convection of air, a resistance due to the first insulator, a resistance due to the second insulator, a resistance due to the steel, a resistance due to the convection of the steam, and then finally T steam. 
And so we'd have two convective resistances and three conductive resistances. Okay, so when we start to take into account convective resistance, we need to make sure that we always that we see a fluid, we're going to take into account that resistance there. In this case, it's a simplification and it's only taking into account the convective resistance of air. So we're ignoring the nitrogen for now. Those are the two things that are different in this question. Okay, so we have the H, we have H for air, check out, we have H for air. So we can calculate what is the resistance for air by doing one over H area. And we can calculate the resistance for the sphere by the conduction one from the insulator by doing this guy here. Since we know that from going from the outside to the inside, we have to cross all the layers. There's no other way around it. We know these guys are all in series, right? So it's a system that's, these resistance here are in series. So that means we can sum them up to have the final one. And when we have the final one, we can find what's the energy that's going into the um, nitrogen. That's exactly what we're gonna do. So let's start by calculating the one for conduction. That'll be one over four pi. Um, what is the convective, sorry, the conduction of the insulator? 0 0.0017. R1 and R2, we haven't figured out our R's yet, so let's do that. It's quite important to do. My first radius will leave from the center and will go to the beginning of the insulator. My second radius will leave from the center and it will go into the outer layer of the insulator, right? So note that our insulator is going to be covering from R1 to R2. This R1, we have the diameter of the sphere. The diameter of the sphere, where is it? It's 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So that means that R1 is, let me hear the corner. R1 is uh, 0.25 meters. And R2 will be the 0.25 meters plus whatever the thickness is of our insulator. And the thickness of our insulator is 25. Yeah, those are the two radiuses. So we can plug those guys in here. So it'll be 0 0.25 and 0 0.25 plus 25 and 10 to the minus three. Okay, these guys are in meter and that guy there is in watts per meter Kelvin. So meter, meter, we're left with Kelvin per watts like we would expect for any resistance, thermal resistance. This turns out to be 17.02. Okay, and now we can expect the resistance from the air to be little, right? Definitely not as much as the insulator layer. And that will be one over H for air area. And then the area of the sphere, right? The area is a sphere we need to do it's gonna be 20 times four pi r squared, right? That's the area of a sphere. And if you guys recall, um, actually not if you guys recall, which r are we talking about? Is it r1 or r2? Oh, it depends, right? If we're talking about the nitrogen, the convective convection of nitrogen, we would use r1 because the nitrogen, the convection is related to this area here. The convection of the air, however, which is what we're interested in is on this area here, on the outer surface area of the sphere. So we're going to be using R2 for it, right? So in here, we're interested in R2. Okay, so we plug those numbers in, square the second radius, and I got a tiny number of 0 0.0526. Let me go ahead and break these guys up so they're not confusing to you. There you go. Okay, since the system is in series, we can do so because 
we can sum up the R's. So it will be R of the air plus the R of conduction from the insulator. And this will be, check out, we're going to be summing pretty much this 0, 2, if the 0, 5 here, right? Which is 0 0.07. Don't really care about the rest. Which means that RQ, and know how Q is the easiest thing after you have the resistance, right? RQ will be the difference in temperature, which is the uh, 300 Kelvin minus the 77 Kelvin divided by 17.07. Kelvin per watts, which gives us 13.06 watts. You don't have to assume anything, so this is precisely the amount of energy that's going into the nitrogen. Okay, so that will be part one of our problem. So far, any questions? All good. Okay, yeah, good. so second part of the question. What is the mass loss rate per day of liquid boil off? Okay, so how much mass are we losing? Part two, let's do part two, part two. What is the mass loss? So first thing I did saw this was check out what was the boiling temperature of nitrogen and I found it was precisely 77 Kelvin. So that means that like as per our last class, right, all the energy that is going into the nitrogen is being used as latent energy to convert it from a uh, liquid into vapor or a gas. This gas is probably better. Okay. So if you guys recall, just by looking at the unit, you can look at the unit from the thing that was given, which is the vaporization one, or just look at the unit of latent heat. We know that we can multiply that by a mass flow rate and get the amount of energy. So if you want to know what's the mass flow rate that we can convert from liquid to gas, we can just get the amount of energy that's going in and divide by the latent heat, which in this case, we have everything, right? We have this and we have this. Okay, you guys remember that joules, uh, a watt same thing as a joule per second. So you can see how joules are gonna go away and we're gonna be left with kilograms per second. Let me do this math. And this turns out to be 65.3 times 10 to the minus six. Kilograms per second, okay? So what is happening here? Let's go back and zoom into our little drawing. See how we have this little vent here, conveniently placed? So the idea is that this is a simplification, right? All the liquid nitrogen that becomes gas is going to escape from that little vent, right? That's the simplification of this problem. So that means that we're gonna be losing, because of this energy that's coming in from the outside, because of, because of these um, 13 watts that are coming into the outside, we'll be losing 65 times 10 to the minus six kilograms per second. The question, however, asks us what is the loss per day? So we just need to do some conversion. <clears throat> I'm losing, if my mass loss is 65 times three, 10 to the minus six kilograms per second. And I know that I have, I want days in the bottom. And I know that in one day I have 24 hours. And I also know that in one hour, I have 3,600 seconds. Then I can happily get rid of these seconds of these hours and be left with per day. This turns out to be about five, approximately 5.64 kilograms per day. So that would be the amount of mass loss that we'd have per day just because of the boil off, right? That's the idea behind this problem. Now we're given the density as well, and we don't really need to do anything about it, but I use the density and the volume to calculate how much nitrogen I had in there. And it turns out I have about 52.6 kilograms of nitrogen. Okay, so just as an extra bit of information, that means we're losing about 
10% per day. Okay, from that sphere, where's there? Do you have any question, guys?